All right, here we are at episode three of Meriwether's World. Currently, we have no viewers, but the universe obviously just doesn't know how egotistical I am. That won't stop me. So, episode three here at Meriwether's World. Uh, new catchphrase, harvesting the past, feeding the present, preserving the future. And tonight, we are going to talk once again about food security. Well, hi, Tina. Followed, so food security followed by uh, just an open question and answer. Uh, last week during the presentation, I felt there was something lacking, so I don't want to spend the whole day or the, the whole show trapped in a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm going to limit to just a small bit of that. Hello, Bonnie. Uh, so food security, edible landscaping, uh, hill country plants, though, the because they're landscaping plants, they really can be used anywhere. Uh, before I start, a few things first. Tonight's sponsor is Spear Survival. I've had a long time relationship with this group. They do, well, basically, if you want to be Aragorn from the Lord of the Rings, these are the people you need to talk to. Bring up the uh, website. Oh, uh, I'm having, oh, let me introduce something here, something also that's going on. And I have uh, Miniweather helping me with today's show, running some of the links and so forth. So we'll see how that works. Uh, a little chaotic here. It's been a crazy day at work. Uh, but here I am. Here we are. Cool. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Kerry. Hey, Clayton. All right. So, uh, sp Spear Survive. Oh, hey, I did it. Spear Survival, like I said, they are, if you could put up the link, they are the, really some of the best teachers as far as wilderness survival, tracking, situational awareness, sniper rifle techniques, Spear Survival. Okay, still working out kinks here. Okay, um, like I said, tracking, of course, I do the edible plants and medicinal plant workshops for them. So like I said, everything you need basically to be Aragorn. They are tonight's sponsor. I've had a long multi-year relationship with them. They are a top-notch crew. So next thing I want to say, like I said, we are talking about food security and edible landscaping and in particular the hill country. So first thing I want to do is bring up another book and... Unfortunately, I'm going to take this camera rather than have you stare at many weather. Tree, Shrubs, and Vines of the Texas Hill Country. Uh, you notice I have all these post-it notes in it. So the red are poisonous, the green are edible, and the blue are medicinal. If you go to the Foraging Texas website, and the link will be posted here in a second, uh, it brings you to the post called The Annotated Tree, Shrubs, and Vines of the Texas Hill Country where I go through the book, page number, plant, name, and then tell you, is it edible, is it medicinal, is it toxic? Um, this book is designed for landowners to identify the plants on their property. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out where my hands should go. Um, but an excellent resource for the sort of plants that will grow in your area. All right, and I got a thumbs up from... Kiki, so apparently the links are working. Okay, uh, another book I want to mention in regards to the edible landscaping, of course, I mentioned it last time was Backyard Foraging by Ellen Zakos. Uh, this is a great book, again, for hiding food in your backyard. It covers multiple really beautiful uh, edible plants that most people don't realize have uh, an edible side to them. So again, if you want to hide food in your yard where your homeowners association doesn't give you a ticket for gardening in your front yard, this is the book you want. And that link will go up here in a moment too. All right, so now let us actually jump to the presentation. So uh, we left off last week with Purple Sage. This week uh, I'm going to continue on into some flowers and other things that are useful. Uh, starting with Society Garlic. Now, Society Garlic is in the onion family, and uh, it can be used in all the ways that chives can be used. 
uh, use the flowers, the stems, the leaves. Now, one of the nice, well, there's two really good things about this plant as far as edible landscaping goes. Three, three really good things about this plant as far as edible landscaping goes. Of course, the first is it's really pretty. Four, four things. <laughs> okay, probably should have thought this out more. Uh, it's beautiful. It's durable. It's edible. It adds good seasoning to your foods. And it's high in vitamin C. Most onions are uh, a pretty good source of vitamin C, not quite the, the size of lemons and limes and oranges, but the society garlic, it will give you vitamin C too, which as we learned last week is very important. The human body cannot store vitamin C. The human body cannot produce vitamin C. It needs a source of vitamin C every day to keep everything together, really. And so the society garlic is a good thing. If you look around, you'll see there's probably a lot of it already in your neighborhood. Okay, let me just look here. Uh, everyone else have a black screen. Um, ba -ba -bum, I don't know. Hey, I'm just looking to see if there's any... Um, let's see, lots of spinning. I have to watch after... Flip the light switch on. I actually have multiple lights here. So uh, is it too dark? I don't know how to make it any lighter. Oh, well. Um, okay, so as far as society garlic goes, are there any questions on that? If not, like I said, you can use it as a seasoning. It's a good source of vitamin C. It's a beautiful plant. It lasts most of the year. Uh, low water requirements, just an all-around good edible landscaping plant. Okay, we are going to skip gay feather, uh, even though it is a source of calories. Uh, usually to grow enough of it, it's not going to be easy to do. And now let's go to the canna lily. Uh, a lot of you may have seen this. Are we frozen? Oh, there we go. Uh, okay. Uh, to do. Okay. So, canna lily. Uh, this is a very nice, beautiful landscaping plant. Very durable down here. Uh, up north, where I'm from, originally Minnesota, every fall we would have to dig up the tubers and put them in our root cellar to get them through the winter. But down here, they seem to do okay. Now, you can see they have these big tubers here. And those are basically potatoes, big potatoes. You can use them just like potatoes. Uh, a lot of times at Thanksgiving, I will actually hide. Ah, okay. I need to not touch that and put my hands here. Okay, so a lot of times at Thanksgiving, I will use these tubers in addition to regular potatoes just because it amuses me to sneak that sort of thing in there. They are high in starch, pound for pound. They actually have slightly more starch than your basic potato. Um, they are a little more difficult to peel because if you look at it, they form these chunks and grow off one another. Kind of, I was going to say like a, a sweet potato, but the true sweet potato, not the modern orange weird sweet potatoes that people eat nowadays. Uh, other things, because they are starch, they like I said, they are a big potato, not only can you cook them up like potatoes, but you can also do other starchy things with them. You can pound them into flour, which you can then use to make gravies. It is a gluten-free flour, so you're not going to be able to make the puffy breads, but you'll be able to make the fried uh, foods really well. Uh, also being starch, if there are any uh, Polish people out there in particular, or Russians, you can use these to make alcohol, and if you don't mind breaking federal laws, you can then distill the federal uh, the alcohol into vodka, canna lily vodka. Now, these are one of the plants that I like to kind of gorilla garden around places because they are quite attractive. You know, they have nice big flowers, nice big foliage. Uh, they grow in nice thick clumps. So in abandoned areas, waste areas, places that are could use a little urban landscaping. This is my one of my key plants for that to stick around in there. Just to uh, you know, make sure there's food and, and sources of potatoes when the zombies come more than anything else. It's Doreen Lepa. Hello, Buffy. Long time friend. Like I said, I think I mentioned last, uh, last week, Doreen and I have known each other since kindergarten. 
Somehow she stayed pretty and I turned into this. But anyway, I digress. So canna lilies, main thing here is it is a source of calories. And in any sort of really emergency, long-term bad times, calories is going to be one of the things you really, really, really need. All right. And so I talked about the tubers. Uh, side note, the big banana-like leaves, they can be used to wrap food for roasting as if it were uh, banana leaves. Think of it as nature's aluminum foil with out the aluminum. Okay, a few other plants to talk about. Now let's talk about the sweet potato. You may have seen sweet potatoes used in landscaping all over the place. They're an extremely hot, tolerant plant, form nice green, bushy, viney, bushy, landscapey thingies, uh, or occasionally you also get the purple variety. These leaves are edible. They're very high in nutrients, especially vitamin A and a, a lot of minerals, some vitamin C, not as much, excuse me, not as much as some of the other plants, but they still have a great source of calories. Uh, sorry, the leaves are a great source of nutrients. And then the tubers that are associated with them. If you uh, dig these vines up, you will find potato-like tubers. Uh, the one annoyance not really a problem, but an annoyance with the tubers is they go through spurt growths. So when they get water, they suddenly grow bigger and usually they end up with some splits to them. And then during the drier things they are just kind of growing slowly and then some more water will come and they'll grow bigger again. So the end result is you can get these big tubers, but they have these splits through them that just make peeling kind of hard. Uh, the best thing, just roast them whole and you know, kind of peel off the, the skin afterwards. But the sweet potato uh, is a really, really, really good landscaping plant. Again, just because of the nutritional value of the leaves and the calorie, uh, calories available from the tubers. As far as storing the leaves of the sweet potato for later use, uh, I've never tried freezing them, but they should freeze pretty much like spinach, just from the texture. Uh, you probably want to blanch them first, stick them in some boiling water for a minute to denature the enzyme that breaks the cell wall down, and then freeze them. But you can dehydrate them and then have a, like a crumbly nutrient burst to your food. Mm -hmm. All right, checking. I had to exit. Okay, I apologize for any choppy sort of video or anything. Uh, we are flying. We have every internet device in the house shut down except for my computer and the one mini weather is, is using. <laughs> but, uh, okay. So, moving on. Why is... Okay. Any questions on the... Sweet potatoes. If not, we will be moving on to the next. And actually, we're going to skip the passion vine. That's actually more medicinal than edible. Um, though it is really good for making margaritas. But we'll probably have a whole class on drinking wild plants at another time. Okay, yucca. Here is, I believe, the last one I wanted to talk about. I was up in the hill country actually just uh, this spring, and I noticed all the wild yucca stalks were coming up. They hadn't produced the flowers yet, but they had the stalks. And the stalks, if you take those before, when they're just basically a stick growing up out of the, the bayonetti uh, sort of uh, leaves. If you take that stalk, cut it up and roast it, and it's actually very sweet. Um, not quite like uh, sugarcane, and it is somewhat fibrous, but the roasted stalk of the yuccas, and this goes for all the yuccas, uh, is actually a really good source of calories. So, like I said, you roast it. After the flowers appear, I actually like the flower buds rather than the flowers themselves for the most part. With the flower buds, uh, taste one or two first to see how the plant is. Yuccas do contain a fair amount of natural soap in them, and it varies from plant to plant how much is actually in there. So in regards to the flowers, taste it, you know, just take a little bite first to see if it's a soapy flavor. If it isn't, 
you're good to go. The flowers, think of them as kind of a cauliflower sort of food. Not a whole lot of calories, um, some uh, vitamins and minerals, not a whole lot there. But again, they are they're fiber, there's food, there's flavor, things like that. The, uh, I want to say this, the, I mentioned they kind of taste like cauliflower, but my personal use, I use them more like okra. Uh, where one would use okra, I use the flower buds. Later on, if the new flowers taste okay, I like those with scrambled eggs or just added to salads. Then the last thing that comes from the yucca is the fruit. Then we'll go back here. And again, these are kind of hit or miss. Think of them as desert eggplants. Take them, taste a little nibble, see how it is in the saponin wise, you know, the natural soap flavor. If it's not too bad, go ahead and cook it like you would an eggplant. So any questions on the yucca? Okay, if not, um, you know, that's kind of it. So on the the edible landscaping, the plants that I wanted to cover. So let's go back to me and let's talk a little bit more about food security because uh, a long time, I started this whole foraging Texas thing about 10 years ago, actually over 10 years ago. Wow. And at the time, the classes consisted of 50% hippies and 50% survivalists, uh, which made for some really interesting class dynamics, but you know, everyone worked through them and uh, it worked out all right. But in both cases, the people had concerns about food. Uh, on the one hand, the, uh, if the, from the survivalist point of view, if the economy goes to, to hell uh, and there's no food available in grocery stores like Venezuela now and what's going on there and Bolivia soon and a couple of other countries, uh, you know, they wanted to know what food was around them to eat. Where on the other side, uh, who I lovingly refer to as the hippie side, their concern was more the adulteration and de-unnatrification. I just made that word up. De-unnatrification of our food, a lot of the uh, genetic engineering and things like that. So they wanted to go back to the source of the foods. And so there was a lot of talk in these classes about, you know, living off the land and foraging for survival and you know how can they do that and my answer was always you can't you can't you can get nowadays a lot of the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and phytochemicals and all those things that your body needs from wild edible plants you will be able to satisfy you and your family's needs from that respect the place where you run into problem is calories. From wild plants, calories are a difficult thing to obtain. You find them from the nuts, the tubers, and the seeds of plants. So if you think about it, the, the baby plants, the part of the plant, you know, the, the reproductive part of the plant that has to fuel the plant until it grows high enough to do photosynthesis. So you're, you know, basically harnessing that sun's energy that the plant was going to use to grow but now you're taking it for yourself but seeds nuts and tubers are very seasonal um, whereas a lot of times if you're going after the leaves or the flowers especially here in texas those leaves those flowers will be around for months and months whereas the fruit you know, in particular the seed the nut and the tuber that has a much smaller window so getting the, the 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 calories you need from the wild is very very difficult uh, during the depression pretty much all small game and large game from you know squirrels up to deer were wiped out in the united states because everyone was you know hunting them for food i mentioned in the past my mom hates these classes that i do because the reason i know this stuff is we grew up poor and so one of our main sources of food was the wild. For years, the only meat we ate was the fish, pheasant, deer, uh, squirrel, rabbit, the sort of things that we would hunt. So long story short, where I am going with this is if you are concerned about the way the world is going and you want to make sure you can feed your family, 
by all means learn foraging to get the vitamins and the nutrients and that sort of thing but store calories store rice store beans store pasta store sugar just something like that those are the things that you will need to supplement all the really good stuff you're getting from the wild uh, you're going to need to store calories because there's just a not a lot out there uh, melanie black mentions yes insects are a great source of protein uh, one of my talks eventually will be all the really yummy edible bugs uh, here in texas we'll see how that goes um, but uh, okay so at this point you know that's mainly what i wanted to say in regards to the uh, food security as far as you know foraging and you know storing food i mentioned the uh backyard foraging and i want to bring this book back up here and let me just jump to camera two the gaia's garden and i mentioned this this is uh a really excellent introduction into what's called permaculture permaculture being basically creating a self-sustaining ecosystem from edible foods in traditional permaculture they would actually use domesticated foods you know starting with the trees the shrubs the vines uh, the lower plants down to the weeds down to the ground cover everything out of plants that really play well together but have an edible source i did that with my backyard i have your normal 30 foot by 70 foot back suburban backyard and it's converted into a edible uh food forest i'm getting an alert here what <laughs> Okay, um, edible food forest. So uh, the last time I took a deep survey, a year-long survey of my backyard was uh, 2014. Over the course of the year, I had 81 edible, drinkable, or medicinal plants uh, in my backyard, which was pretty awesome. And since then, I've added quite a few more. So uh, one of the ways I did this, because a lot of the wild edible plants, the seeds aren't available for purchase. So uh, I cheated and I tapped mother nature and let me explain how I did it here. Uh, birds, birds are an excellent source of seeds. So in my backyard, I tore up patches of the, the, the sod, the, the, you know, the St. Augustine grass, got bare earth, put branches in it, bare branches in the you know the center of these these piles of of earth uh, birds would perch on the branches i put some uh, bird baths with water excuse me and also just some sand baths where birds would come and fluff around in the sand they'd go drink some water then they'd go perch on the branches and then they'd poop and by pooping in the bird poop there was all sorts of seeds probably 60 of the edible plants I got in my yard came from bird poop. Now, one thing, if you are doing this, try not to have a bird feeder. If you have a bird feeder, the only seeds you're gonna get are the seeds that are in that bird seed, and most of them are not wild and not native, so avoid that. And if possible, try and talk your neighbors out of having bird feeders too. Uh, Souffle, are all flower yucca flowers edible? Uh, if they don't taste good, you don't want to eat them. The reason being, they don't taste good because they're high in a natural soap that can give you diarrhea. So if they taste good, they're edible in the case of yucca flowers. If they taste soapy, don't eat them. All right. Oh, Jennifer is like her rice. Like that you're mentioning calories. I'm a bioarchaeologist and talk to lack of calories in prehistoric groups. Awesome. We need to talk. But yeah, I, I look at the history of mankind, really the history of accessible calories. So, you know, war is over resources and there's no greater resource than food. Okay. <laughs> so I let the birds, <laughs> jumping right back to mid-sentence, the birds come on the branches, they poop, and things start growing. And then I start identifying the weeds that are growing. 
and I don't have it here. I was going to grab a book, but there's uh, a lot of good books out there for identifying the weeds available, you know, that are popping up in your yard. And from that, I just look and see if it's edible. I'd leave it. If it wasn't, it'd get yanked. And eventually I would encourage them to reproduce and then transplant them to areas of the yard that fit a rough sort of aesthetics, if you will. Uh, I wanted my yard to be loaded with food, be kind of wild, but also have at least a certain appeal to it visually and aesthetically. So uh, it seems to have worked. Like I said, the, the four years ago, I had 81 different edible, medicinal, and drinkable plants uh, show up. So we're doing all right there. Uh, with the permaculture, going back to this book, really here, if you want to use my method, you do want to pick the trees. So uh, pecan trees, fig trees, uh, walnut trees, black walnut. Be careful with black walnut. They like to kill other plants. But you put the trees in place, some of the bushes, and then kind of let nature take its course from there. Again, the Ellen Zakos, she doesn't go into permaculture per se, but you can use this as a guide for what sort of plants that you should use to create your own food forest. Tim Chavez, I wish I could replace all my Bermuda grass with native ground cover. Uh, native ground cover around here would be really tall prairie grass, which your neighbors probably wouldn't like either. Okay, so uh, 26 minutes on food security. I think that's enough. We, if you have questions on food security, feel free to ask. Otherwise, uh, let's just see what people have. And Wade Phelps, uh, episode we see, yeah, I'm actually thinking about that. I need to do a walkthrough, a video walkthrough. Uh, unfortunately, at 8 o'clock already, it's dark out, so it would be a pre-recorded sort of uh, event. But, yeah, that's definitely on the list. Okay, just checking here. Um, I So, quick beg here. I have very limited screen real estate, and I am saving up to get a second monitor. So, if anyone by chance has a monitor they're no longer using, like their kids went off to school or something, hit me up, and I will... Uh, send you an address to send it to me and I will be forever praying for your immortal soul and your yard. Okay, uh, anyone here near Corpus? Trevor Gray. Uh, Corpus, I've taught down there at the, was it Southwest Botanical Gardens and also Osso Bay Wetlands. Both those locations have a good uh, collection of native plants. The Osso Wetland is wild, so it's really native there. And then the, the Southwestern Botanical Gardens is you know, obviously planted. Um, but uh, it's been a year and a half since I've been down there. They haven't uh, invited me. I taught there fairly often, especially before a uh, bike accident I had several years ago. But uh, check them out. The nice thing, especially the Botanical Gardens there, is they have nameplates for the plants so you can see at least get an idea what plants are and then look up to see if they're edible anyway, I can't believe my dad just said hit me up looks like he's more up with the times than I am yes I'm a pretty cool dad I am in with those young kids all right <laughs> Ooh, uncommon bees I have a few monitors message me I will um, at this point, let's just take another uh, station identification. Uh, by that, I mean I'm going to try and point. I lose track. Okay, you know what? Wow. Okay, Spear Survival. Can you put the link up for Again, I just want to mention these are tonight's sponsors. And for those of you coming late, Spear Survival is a multi-pronged survival skills school. So not only wilderness survival, but even things like uh, situational uh, awareness. They have some of the top bouncers in the nation come in and teach a class on basically how to know what's going on without people knowing you know what's going on. Long range sniping, tracking, medicinal plants, edible plants, as I mentioned earlier, basically everything you need to become Aragorn. 
uh, or one of the Dundane Rangers. So Tarzan, any of these people, uh, Sheena of the jungle, if you will. Their wilderness survival classes, I highly recommend if you spend any time outdoors. The Spear Survival, they have a tiered system where the first level, the beginner level of wilderness survival is basically teaching you how to use the gear that you bought from Academy and so forth, the fire starters, the knives, how to make a shelter properly, how to protect yourself from the elements, the, the basic key things you need to survive. And then it goes up from there up to the uh, knife only weekend where, okay, here's a knife, see you in three days. <laughs> so sort of things like that are kind of fun. Let's see. Uh, Rebecca, I have tons of horse herb and frog fruit as ground cover. Ah. Horse herb. So Rebecca Rebecca is asking about horse herb, also known as straggler daisy and frog fruit. These are two common things. Uh, if you can run to my website, I'm just to the Foraging Texas and get the frog fruit. The uh, horse herb is not poisonous, but there is no nutritional value uh, available to humans from it either. So the horse herb is basically the brown paper bag of the plant world, if you will. Uh, its only real use is a massive dose of fiber if you're induced or in need of a massive dose of fiber. Now the frog fruit is a bit more interesting. The little flowers, they look like little pineapples. Those aren't edible, but the leaves are. The leaves are actually very, very nutritious. They're kind of tough, so you want to cook them, steam them, boil them, saute them, you know, treat them again like a, like a sweet potato leaf, uh, if you will. But you want to cook the frog fruit, and that's actually a really good source of nutrition. Let's see, Stephanie, I have an idea. If a local reseller of native plants would endorse these videos, uh, we could get learning place and get them to plant. Actually, that brings up a, a, a really good thing here, Stephanie. Thank you for reminding me. I don't have a link to it, uh, but in October, I want to say October 15th, the Houston Arboretum, that weekend, they are having their native plant sale. So I will get you a link for that. Um, in the past, I've gone through and given the Houston Arboretum a list of which of their plants for sale are edible or medicinal or poisonous. Uh, you know, the information in case uh, someone asks. Uh, they have some new people in charge. I'm not sure where that part of the program stands or not. But the Houston Arboretum native plant sale coming up in October, I want to say the weekend of October 15th, excellent source uh, for native plants that grow really well down here. Uh, Tina Marie is asking, the plant on the cover of Ellen's book. Uh, so, okay, oops. We have the daylily, the cedar juniper, acorns, a rose, a dogwood, and I believe this might be spice berries. This particular one, on the, the big one here, doesn't grow in Texas natively, uh, but with some, oh, hey, cool. My daughter is awesome. She was able to get you the link to the native plant sale. Fist bump. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I do that to her in public. It's totally embarrassing for her. It's one of the few joys parents have, really. Okay. Uh, Clayton, in Mexico, is we ever see Mexican food in Michigan? I'm going to take it as a sign of the apocalypse. Man, I love Mexican culinary culture. I do too. Some of the best meals I had were down when I was working in the oil fields outside Poza Rica. I have no idea what I was eating, um, but it was good. It was brown and there was some chocolate in one of them and cheese and everything else. Oh yes, a multi-pronged spear is a trident. That is true, Melanie. Um, it was a bad choice of words on my part, but it seemed fitting for them. Actually, Trident Survival. And it's kind of hard to see, but the Spear Survival, actually the spear stands for skills, planning, ethos, action, and something else. I can't make it out. I'm sorry, Eric. Uh, but they are good people. Uh, Joel Cook asking, how much red sorrel is safe to eat because of the oxalic acid? Okay. Uh, wood sorrel, oxalis species, has a chemical called oxalic acid in it. 
which gives it a nice tangy, lemony sort of flavor. This oxalic acid in large doses, and I'll get to how big is large, uh, can start reacting with the calcium in your blood and then get filtered out into your kidneys in kidney stones. Um, this is a theoretical issue. There has never been any medical review or anything where this has actually happened, where someone has eaten so much wood sorrel uh, that they've ended up with kidney stones. But that being said, there are lawyers on this planet, even here on Meriwether's world, there are lawyers lurking around. And so my general word of advice is don't eat more than like, you know, a bowl full. And when you do, make sure you have plenty of fluids, are avoiding most uh, exterior or extra sources of calcium. And if possible, you know, have something acidic like uh, cranberry juice or something just to maximize or really minimize the chance of any calcium oxalate forming. Like I said, there's never been a case of it, but it is a warning that all us foragers give. Uh, oh, Eric says reason. So skills, planning, ethos, action, reason. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> okay, <laughs> jumping around. Um, I'm being pointed out here. Oh, love bugs? Don't eat love bugs. They are very acidic. Um, oh, yep. Okay. So, and in case you haven't figured it out, the, uh, like I said, the role of Meriwether uh, will be played by Minnie Weather today. If you see posts, it's her. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, Stephanie Walker, if you're sensitive to oxalate, just avoid. Yes, if you are have a history of kidney stones or other some sort of uh, prone to dehydration, also osteoporos osteoporosis, <laughs> Um, you know, if you're already having an issue getting calcium to your blood, uh, your bones, you probably want to avoid the oxalis or the wood sorrels. But also keep in mind, a lot of plants have oxalic acid, spinach, rhubarb, uh, a lot of things like that. Oh, side note, I see uncommon bees mentioned they use oxalic acid to treat uh, bees for the varroa mites. Oxalic acid is also the key component in a lot of wood bleaches that you can get at uh, Lowe's. Um, so I know, you know, I'm a chemist, and so every so often I would need oxalic acid for a reaction. And rather than pay 50 bucks for a little jar of it from Aldrich, I'd just run down to Lowe's and get it for like four bucks for a big jar. Your chemistry information for the day. All right, so what else do we have? Uh, ooh, someone loves uh, frog fruit, uh, Clayton. Uh, bone set for the bones. Yeah, uh, Uncommon bees, they, they mentioned bone set for the bones. They're just kind of bragging slash teasing me. I spend uh, not nearly enough time out at the Uncommon Bees property, but so far it's one of the two places in Texas where I've actually found bone set. Kevin Rust, spell that. Uh, <laughs> T-H-A-T, that. What, what did you expect? I'm a dad. We do dad jokes. Okay, any other questions? Because we got 20 minutes yet to fill, and I could play Surf Rock, or we could continue to just play Pick uh, Meriwether's Mind. Um, but to do, let's see, whoops. <laughs> yeah, Meriwether is pretty awesome, and that's just not her dad saying that, well... It's her employer, too. I should point out, uh, actually, if you bring up the Foraging Texas shop, so the deal I made with Mary Weather, uh, Minnie Weather, uh, if she would help me, she would get a large chunk of whatever was made from today's Amazon purchases through my Amazon store. So if you go to the, yeah, the Amazon shop Foraging Texas link that she's about to put up, the purchases there, 50% of those purchases, she will get the the 6%. <laughs> so she gets 6% of 50%. And on average, that 50% comes to, uh, yeah, a small amount. But hey, it's there. Oh. <laughs> like I said, there, there's a time lag between the different screens I have open and I just saw a fist bump going on and I thought 
Miss uh, uh, Mini Weather wanted to fist bump me. Okay. Uh, any other questions? So, if not, I got some questions for you. First being, is one hour too long? Should we do this just a half hour? Uh, I know going back and watching a full hour based on my stats, that doesn't happen a lot. Um, I am happy to say that the first episode, uh, I had 4,229 viewers. The second episode, it was 6,400 6, and some viewers. I'm not sure what we will get from this one, but we'll see. Um, like I said, I, I do this not... Well, okay, first, I have a huge ego, so it's cool having my own show. Uh, uh, but mainly just to reconnect people to nature. So it's kind of cool. Um, ba -ba -boom, the branch with the red berries. Yeah, uh, I will get back to you, Tina, on what that plant is. Or better yet, I will hand the book over to Miniweather, and she can look it up. Try and figure out what that is. Usually at the front of the book, it will talk about the pictures, what the uh, cover picture is. An hour is good. Okay, so we got two votes for an hour. Um, in that case, you guys need to start asking me more questions. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? Oh, some upcoming episodes. I already mentioned edible bugs. Uh, I also plan on doing a thing on mushrooms, which I suspect will be very popular. Ooh, Jackie Parker, I listen two hours of Sudden Weed and it's never long enough. Stay long, my friend. Okay. Uh, ooh, top 10 backyard choices. Excellent, excellent, excellent choice, Eric. Okay, let me think out loud here. So number one being acorns. So a an oak of some sort. Number two, fig tree. Fig trees do exceptionally well in a lot of areas of Texas. Um, there's a variety of fig that's going to do well for you. They produce a tremendous amount of food. Uh, the fruit can be dried. It can be preserved in all sorts of different ways. So it's really good that way. Uh, another is a mulberry. Uh, the mulberry, red mulberry, would be my choice there. Uh, they Mulberry trees produce some of the largest crops of fruit of any tree. So that's really good. And again, with the, the mulberries, you can eat the fruit raw, you can mash it into fruit leather, you can make wine, jelly, you know, all sorts of things with it. So yeah, so we have the oak tree, we have the uh, fig tree and the mulberry tree. And then I'd also throw a pecan tree in there. Um, it kind of goes back and forth between the pecan and the acorns. Overall, you get more food quicker, more quickly from the acorns than you would from the pecan tree, but especially if you're just starting out, definitely pecan. Mid-level, I would go and with Eliagnus, uh, which is a really good permaculture plant because it is a nitrogen fixer. It basically takes nitrogen gas from the air, converts it into nitrates, and fertilizes all your other plants, and the berries are quite tasty. Definitely a Turk's cap because they are beautiful and they have multiple edible parts, the leaves, the flowers, the fruit. Um, they attract all sorts of hummingbirds, which are also tasty. Actually, no, don't eat, don't eat hummingbirds. They're bony. Um, but yeah, the Turk's cap and the Eliagnus are two really good shrubs. Another one that I haven't mentioned, but uh, I learned from Ellen Zakos in her book, and I do have in my yard, is the pineapple guava. Uh, which produces these kind of small fruit that tastes kind of pineapple-y, kind of guava-y-ish. Um, very prolific and does very well here. Those actually can grow into a small tree, so you have to do some pruning there. Uh, so that's like six or seven. So we have acorn, pecan, mulberry, uh, fig, Eliagnus, Turk's cap, pineapple, guava, Okay, we're good there. Yopan Holly, need my caffeine, especially in a survival situation. You want to be alert. And from a medicinal plant, let's go with yarrow. And there's so many other good medicinal plants. 
Um, wow. It's like too many choices for the the tenth one. Um, goldenrod. Yeah. Between Yarrow and Goldenrod, you take care of a lot of the, the different day-to-day -day sort of things going on. Uh, Eric asks uh, about Carpella Americana, American Beautyberry. Good plant, not in my top 10 choices for backyard landscaping. I do have several in my backyard, um, mainly because I wanted a readily uh, available source for making jam, jelly, and wines. But if I were setting up a, a survival garden, they would be lower on my list. Uh, Rebecca, pawpaw trees. The first off, the um, Houston Arboretum native plant sale will have pawpaws for sale there. Um, there is a number of nurseries around. Check with the uh, not the big name nurseries, but the smaller independent like Moss Nursery, Cornelius, uh, Arbor Gate up in Tomball. Uh, those are the ones. The other nice thing about pawpaws, if you can get some seeds they uh, grow really well. One thing about pawpaws though, is they are not self-fertile. You actually need two pawpaw trees to get fruit. Also, the flowers are pollinated by flies. And to do that, they stink really badly. So, uh, you know, for a while, while you have the pawpaw flowers, your yard may smell kind of bad. Yes, on uh, the beautyberry, the leaves are a really good insect repellent. Let's see, avocado and olives are the only ones I can think of have uh, high fat content. Uh, unfortunately, the avocados, we Houston is generally too far north for the avocados. There is a big push to find a frost uh, impervious avocado. But to my knowledge at this point, and I keep looking, there isn't one. So an avocado tree, you can try growing it inside. And then in regard to olives, uh, surprisingly enough, there isn't a really good, real, uh, reliable uh, olive cultivator here. Uh, the highest recommended uh, olive tree is, it's like a, a buque. It's a bu. there's a U in it. It's like Albuquerque, but a buque something like that, olives. Uh, you can find them at Lowe's and Home Depot and things like that in the spring. But uh, in general, I haven't had much look, luck with them. Surprisingly enough, if you live in Pearland, Texas, at the intersection of Orange Road and uh, Highway 35, there is a hardware store. So there's a Walmart and then there's a hardware store. And right on the corner at Orange Road and Highway 35, there is the most amazing olive tree right now. It is just dropping tons of fruit. It's the only olive tree I've ever really found in the Houston area, at least, that does well. Um, I suspect up in the hill country, the, the olives might actually do better. They are traditionally a Mediterranean uh limestone soil sort of tree. So they, they might actually do better up in the hill country than they do down here. Uh, there was a, okay, Clayton, there was a question earlier. I, the brook about species of acorns best for making flowers. Okay, let me just throw this out there. Uh, if you are using acorns, there's basically oak trees. There's the red oaks and the white oaks is the big division between the oak trees. Uh, and they are, you know, all the other oak trees are either fall in the red oak family or the white oak family. The white oak, so this one, the white oak family of oaks, their acorns traditionally have less tannic acid in them than the red oaks. The issue though is the white oaks, it takes them two years to make acorns, whereas the red oaks take only one. So even though the acorns of the white oak have a better flavor or easier to leach or generally a little bit larger, the red oak will give you the food year after year after year after year. So in my opinion, I choose the red oak. Ooh, Jackie, she has an amazing backyard there. Uh, she has uh, elder and muscadine, red clover, red bud, yarrow, nettle, wild cucumber. I am so jealous of your wild cucumber, Jackie. Turk's cap, lavender, comfrey, calendula, echinacea. Uh, yeah, they all grow really well here. She has an amazing medicinal garden. Um, and then 
these are great. But again, I look at it from I'm starving. What do I want to eat? It's going to be calories. It's going to be vitamin C. Now, hopefully your neighbor is doing the medicinal plants and you can trade there. Uh, Sarah, there's an olive person here at the Tumble Market that uses some Texas fry. Yes, please, Sarah, find out for me what she uses. Uh, Aronia for mid-level. So, yeah, the... Uh, uh, Barbados cherry. Yes, <laughs> I had to think there, Julie Gracie, the Aronia. The Barbados cherry would make another good uh, mid-level bush, especially because you get three, three crops of berries a year from it if everything goes well. Uh, let's see. Oops. Something's going square here. Uh, okay, Adam Conkren wants to know about using passive flora as a sleep aid. Did you read that? It, uh, did I read that it becomes habit forming? Okay, passive flora. Purple passion vine, uh, beautiful flower, tasty fruit. The leaves actually have a strong sedative in it. If you go to HEB or Kroger in the sleepy time teas, you will see passion vine often listed as one of the ingredients. Very potent. Now, the issue with any chemical induced sleep aid is not so much that it becomes habit forming, you don't become necessarily addicted to that chemical but the body loses the ability to go to sleep naturally without it. So the problem there is if you drink the sleepy time tea every night, then if you stop drinking it, uh, you're not going to be able to get to your sleep because your body, the, the chemicals that it normally produces to, excuse me, to, to send you to sleep, it kind of lowered the, the levels of those because it has these other exterior chemicals out there and the body like plants is lazy if it doesn't need to make something it's not going to make something which is why i have really wimpy muscles uh, yeah don't ask who won the competition between mini weather and i and push-ups it was ugly Ooh, jackie also mentions lamb quarters lamb quarter is one of the best weeds that a bird will bring to you extreme it, lamb's quarter is considered to be a superfood in that it has vitamins minerals protein and calories i really wow this is weird okay um so yeah so the the passiflora good sleep aid but you don't want to use it every day just use it when you really really need to oh cool yep she brought it up mrs uh mini weather is awesome Ooh, Devin gray best plant materials for tinder for fire now this is something i like Obviously, cedar, the stringy, fibery bark of cedar is an excellent fire starter. Pine, the pine sap, it's basically gelled turpentine, which is a nice way of saying plant in a palm. So that's really good. The fluff from goldenrod, uh, one of the plants I mentioned earlier in my, my 10 list to have in there. Um, that works really well, especially from a, a, a fire starter, the uh, fire steel type striker. And if you're really lucky, you have some dead wood that's growing the hoof mushroom, also known as the tinder mushroom, because that pounded and dried is one of the few uh, natural materials that will uh, take a spark from flint and steel. Let's see, other ones. Those are the main ones. So the cedar bark the goldenrod uh, dried flowers, the pine sap, and the hoof mushroom. Let's see, Dawn, I live up in Oak, Fig, Mulberry, Yopan, Turk's Cap. Ooh, two feral cats killed two of my apple trees. And the cherry tree is maybe a get downer. I will tell you, okay, there are some cultivators of apples that are supposed to do well here in like especially the Houston area, they were actually brought over from Israel. But my particular experience with the all the so-called good cultivar of apples for here have never produced anything. Um, even with a chill hour as short as they uh, they have, they haven't had much luck with them. Apples and cherries and, and a number of fruits like that, they need a certain amount of uh, weather where the temperature is below freezing to trigger the plant to produce the flowers and the fruit. And if they don't get enough of those chill hours and they don't produce uh, the fruit. Okay, looking at the clock, it is 8.54. So we are 
uh, coming close to an end here. I want to just throw this out. Stephanie Walker, what does wisteria flowers taste like? They taste like lilac. They pretty much taste the way they smell. The wisteria was used a lot for flavoring bad wine, actually. So if someone hands you a wine that tastes of lilac, it might have just been crappy wine that they're trying to spike with wisteria. But that does make it uh, good. Okay, wow. 55 minutes have passed. So uh, at this point, I'm going to stop and you'll have to save the questions for next week. Um, some of those that I didn't get to during the show, I will go back and answer. Uh, maybe some of them tonight, and, but it may take a day or two to get to them. But I just want to again... I'm getting better at this. Ah, talk about Spear Survival. Can you put up the link? Again, the Spear Survival, I mentioned this is one of the prime, uh, really, survival schools in Texas. They don't just do wilderness survival. They do urban awareness. They do tracking. They do long-range shooting. Um, they bring in some of the top instructors from all over the place, military, civilian, uh, great people great person it's, it's mainly a, a one-man show and then all the amazing instructors he's managed to wrangle over the years so if you're looking to just learn you know wilderness survival urban survival long-range shooting medicinal plants edible plants tracking like i keep saying all those things you need to become aragorn from the lord of the rings spear survival is your people to go to okay four minutes and those of you who have watched the two previous shows know I like to try and come up with some words of wisdom. And surprisingly enough, today's words of wisdom come from an internet meme. Surprisingly. Now, it's a long meme. I'm not going to go through the whole meme. But what it boils down to is this. There are ages of philosophy and ages of spectacle. The ages of philosophy, <coughs> excuse me, that's when the great thoughts are thunk. Think Greek, the mathematics, uh, Indian poetry, but the, the Chinese engineering, all these things. Those were times when, you know, the, the philosophy, the thinking was going on. Then there's also the times of spectacle. Think ancient Rome, when... It's not what you know, it's what people think you are. You know, what sort of show can you put on? You know, what is your brand? How entertaining can you be? Well, right now, we seem to be kind of falling into the uh, spectacle season. So that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as you are aware that we're not in the philosophical time and if you try and bring philosophy into the spectacle time you are just going to be banging your head against the wall that being said that's what i'm trying to do with the show i'm you know, trying to put on a show but something you can actually get stuff out of so hopefully uh i'm succeeding <laughs> i'm trying uh, but please, if you have suggestions on how to make the show better, I really, really, really want to hear them because uh, I want to make the show better. I want to be able to get more information to you. I want it to be more clear. I know I have a tendency to go multiple, you know, I'm like a, you know, three rabbits on speed and two magic mushrooms. Not that I do. I'm just saying that's, you know, everything going on. Um, but anyway, my, my goal is, even though we're in an age of spectacle, an age of circuses, let's try and at least make it educational. Okay, two minutes left. Should we see if Mini Weather has anything to say? Thank you guys for watching my dad's show. It's really sweet and it's awesome to see how far he's come since you know he began all this plant stuff and i'm really honored to be helping him out actually not just for the amazon money obviously even though i'm a teenager and love shopping and all that but like i honestly love seeing him do this and i'm so glad y'all are all here to support him so thanks wow unexpected maybe we'll go to this there. okay so we are in the final seconds of the show um same time next week, like I said, same plant channel, same plant time. 
I'm going to be doing this until I run out of things to say. And I'm pretty sure Miniweather and my coworkers and pretty much anyone who knows me realizes I never run out of things to say. So at that, whoop, uh, we're doing, okay, she is quoting me. Uh, hopefully she doesn't get into school for quoting me. But on that note, it's 9 p.m. Time for you to go join your families and see you next week.